African. Well, hello and welcome to Talk Time. And this week we are taking a look at Palestine. Palestine. That occupied land. Land occupied by the Zionists in Israel. And the occupation of Palestine has many dimensions. The idea, the ideology of separate development, which is substantially not different from the ideology of apartheid and so on. That is what we're going to be discussing today. We're going to be discussing how all of us can help free Palestine from occupation. How all of us, everybody, can contribute to the liberation of Palestine from colonial occupation. Welcome to Talk Time. Welcome back to Talk Time. And as I indicated from the very beginning, we'll be discussing Palestine, not just Palestine, the world in relation to Palestine. Is it possible for Palestine to be liberated from colonial occupation? And if Palestine is to be liberated from colonial occupation, what ought to be done? What is the nature of this colonial occupation? Is it an apartheid state? What is it? And so on. We are particularly privileged to have with us in the studio to discuss these issues, Marian Mantovini, who is a member of the International Secretariat of the BDS, you know, organization. And read what is BDS organization and so on. You're welcome to the studio. Thank you. I'm happy to be with you here. What is the organization that you represent or work for? The Palestinian is fundamentally a coalition of all the different political and social forces in Palestine who came together in 2005 uh, after already decades of struggle of the Palestinian people against the occupation that started in the 60s with the armed struggle and continued then uh, with the popular uprising, the Intifada in the 80s, the attempt to uh, build negotiations in the 90s, uh, and then in the uh, 21st century that uh, looking back and saying, how can we actually get uh, uh, to a situation where negotiations are even possible and without pressure on the occupation that has the power, that profits from that power, uh, it is not even possible to think the possibility of negotiations. And that pressure comes uh, through BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Mm. So in 2005, and uh, that was uh, some five years after the World Conference Against Racism in South Africa, where many Palestinian activists and South African activists met together, and uh, it wasn't only that the moment where then uh, the entire civil society that was uh, united to fight racism in South Africa at that time in the year 2000 understood that what Israel is, is not only occupation, it is additionally as well apartheid. The crime against, uh, of apartheid is still living on in Palestine against the Palestinian people. And from that understanding and from that uh, communication with South Africa and South Africa more in general, that dialogue between the people came then the inspiration to start another boycott movement, the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement uh, uh, against Israel to hold Israel accountable for its crime. So the BDS uh, National Committee is that body that was then formed to give uh, the leadership, the guidance, the reference 
for the many different organizations uh, across the world that have joined in and act together in order to put pressure on Israel, boycott Israel, sa uh, sanction Israel, isolate Israeli apartheid uh, um, in order to be able to give the necessary support to the Palestinian people. Now, you're obviously not Palestinian yourself. How did you come to be involved in the struggle? Yeah, I'm Italian, and uh, I came uh, almost 20 years ago uh, for the first time to Palestine. It was supposed to be just some kind of a solidarity visit, a solidarity brigade, see, learn, and then uh, uh, go back. But it was a particular moment in the Palestinian history, and it was a uh, what we call the reinvasion of the West Bank, uh, i.e., just to understand Palestine, the entire historic Palestine is uh, currently occupied uh, by Israel. 22% um, of what uh, is historic Palestine have been occupied in 1967. Uh, the rest. Uh, uh, in the rest, Israel uh, yields control since uh, the end of the Second World War in 1948. And uh, in those 22%, the 67 uh, territories, how we call them, the West Bank and Gaza, Israel entered uh, uh, by force with all the military might they had in April 2002 uh, into the city centers. Uh, and re uh, wrecked havoc, destroyed everything that could be destroyable uh, uh, in various places. Jenin, in particular, where I uh, was, uh, it was a large-scale massacre, completely destroying everything. And uh, among the rebels and among the literally dead bodies and people trying to uh, survive, uh, uh, one thing that uh, everybody told me is, how is it possible that the world is not watching? How is it possible that the world still supports Israel? Go and do something, tell the world. And more or less, that's what I'm still trying to do. I then joined Palestinian organizations in order to uh, have Palestinian leadership and be useful. Uh, to the Palestinian uh, movements and organizations. And since then, I'm uh, in Palestine and around the world trying to uh, be a messenger for uh, the Palestinian people. How easy is it to be living in Palestine, especially for, for, for you? Yeah, I guess uh, there were two very contradictory uh, things that I've been living. On the one hand, evidently the incredible oppression, and it is not really only l the large-scale massacres that once, once in a while we see on TV, or the killings uh, or destructions of homes. It's the fact that the everyday life, everyday breathing is controlled by Israel. That uh, you live in cities that are literally uh, surrounded by an eight meter high cement wall and in order to go from one place to the other, in order to go to work, in order to go to school, uh, in order to go to hospital, one has to pass through a military checkpoint, the gate in this eight meter high uh, cement wall. And it always depends on whether or not uh, that soldier that is manning this checkpoint wants you, wants you to pass or doesn't want you to pass. So everything is controlled. The access to water is controlled by Israel. Uh, the, uh, the movement is controlled. Uh, you can't get in or out without Israeli control. Even the air is controlled. Even the air waves to have a, a, a cell phone connection or not, that is all controlled by Israel. And this continuous control is something that uh, eats into, uh, into the psyche, and it is incredible how the Palestinians have that uh, steadfastness to stand up every morning and say, we're not going to surrender. We'll start another day of struggle and uh, resistance and resilience and disobedience. That's the one side of it. And the other side was uh, 
the incredible uh, solidarity that I've experienced. It is a people that uh, probably because of uh, decades and generations of struggle and oppression has an inbuilt solidarity to stand with each other and uh, to organize themselves even in the most incredible situations. I mean, uh, one of uh, the cases that I can uh, just talk about is uh, one of the villages, uh, small communities in the Jordan Valley. It's a uh, uh, herders community, small uh, shacks uh, where people are living in with their sheep. <coughs> And Israel tries desperately to uh, uh, destroy everything and uh, ethnically cleanse them in order to take over their land and the water resources for their agro-business uh, illegal settlements. And there are uh, villages that, uh, one in particular that we've been uh, working with, uh, uh, has been destroyed uh, like dozens of times. And it's just now again under the demolition order, and they get destroyed in the morning and in the evening people are coming back and rebuilding it again. And it goes on and on and on. It is this uh, way how people are just not giving up, but standing together, organizing themselves once again to, with this conviction that uh, justice will prevail one, one day. And that's a very beautiful and positive uh, part of uh, what I've been learning in Palestine. Let me hear stories about shortages, power outages, lack of medicines, you know, fuel shortages and so on. How do people just cope in these difficult times? Well, I guess it's really uh, uh, the sharing of resources and as well the, the inventing of resources. And I think the important thing about uh, everything that is shortage in Palestine is not because it isn't there, it's because it's stolen. If there is a shortage of water, it's not because Palestine lacks water. It rains more in Jerusalem every year than it rains in London. Water is there. Who steals the water are the Israelis so that Palestinians don't have it. If there is a lack of electricity, it's not because nobody has built an electricity plant. It's because Israel has bombed it. Uh, so in that sense, uh, that kind of uh, living with the, the lack of uh, something is really as well a way of uh, resisting. One knows that we are lacking it and we need to find a way how to overcome that. Uh, as a form of resistance and struggle. For those of us outside, I mean, sometimes when you listen to the Western media, the impression is created that Palestine internally is divided. Living there, what is your experience? Palestine evidently has many different political parties, factions, movements, unions, and they not always agree on everything. And like I everywhere. guess exactly. I guess that's normal. This idea to think that uh, uh, Palestinians should be united on everything is a bit uh, uh, part of this colonial idea uh, and concept that uh, Palestinians or the others are not good enough to self-determine and self-govern themselves, and hence they bring the occupation and the apartheid regime upon them, and one argument is, see, they're not united. But if they were united in one party, then they would criticize the, them again for being a, a one-party uh, um, people, or not even state. Um, but uh, the fact is as well that while these divisions are there, Palestine has the capacity to come together uh, on many different issues. It's, and the divisions are, on the one hand, natural, on the other hand, very artificially created by Israel. What Israel has been doing since the beginning is dividing the Palestinian people in various sections. And that, again, reminds us very much of what apartheid was in South Africa, where you were black, you were colored, you were Indian, you were whatever else. So if you're Palestinian, you are Palestinian, and for that reason, you don't have the same rights, uh, and you are oppressed. 
and persecuted. But you can be a Palestinian living in Gaza, then you're living in an open-air prison and nothing comes in and out, and every three to four years you have to suffer a large-scale bombing where everything is destroyed, mm -hmm. and it's probably the worst condition one can live in. Then you have the Palestinians uh, in, uh, in the occupied West Bank, which are surrounded by this eight-meter-high cement wall, and uh, uh, what differs really between uh, Gaza and the West Bank is uh, that you do not suffer every three to four years a large-scale bombing, but again, you don't have any rights. Then you can be a Palestinian in Jerusalem. As a Palestinian in Jerusalem, uh, you have more freedom of movement, but you cannot leave your city because as soon as you leave your city, they will not let you back again because you're only a temporary resident, even if your family has been living there for generations. As soon as Israel took over Jerusalem, they decided that Palestinians uh, in Jerusalem would be only temporary. And if they go to study outside or work outside for uh, more than a number of years, then they simply le lose the possibility to come back and access their own city. And then you have the Palestinians that have Israeli citizenship, which have uh, formally rights, Practically, they don't, because like 93% of the land is not accessible for Palestinians, even if they have Israeli citizenship. Uh, many jobs and many uh, uh, communities, uh, many places they can't buy or rent houses. Uh, even if they have Israeli citizenship, they don't have the same rights. And then there is half of the Palestinian people, which are the refugees, which have, Israel has already expelled from their land, and they evidently within their own homeland have no rights whatsoever. They can't even come back. They're not allowed even to put foot in their homeland. So Israel has and is trying to divide the Palestinian people. But what is interesting, when we look at last May, when the last uh, uprising was, or what they call uh, the Intifada of Unity, the Uprising of Unity, it was really all those different Palestinians uh, with citizenship, without citizenship, in Gaza, in the West Bank, in Jerusalem, coming together on the streets once, once again and challenging Israel and its uh, uh, colonial apartheid project. The same thing, the BDS movement, is another example of how Palestinians, uh, and sustainably since, uh, since uh, the call was given out in 2005, are together sitting, planning strategies, uh, and working together. So, yes, there are divisions. Yes, there is a capacity for unity. And I think that's all we need. Well, viewers, you are in a conversation with Marianne Montovani, I hope I got the name right, uh, who actually lives in Palestine sometime and is working with the BDS, the International Secretariat of the BDS Movement. Uh, she would explain a lot more of that. We're going to have a short break. And when we do come back from the break, I want to find out exactly what this BDS movement is doing. What are its priorities? What is the concept? How is it on the ground? BDS. Short break. Hello? Okay, Okay, uh, Why? Why? What's it in? Family Dwelling Company Limited. Yet to borrow home, biofuel, biogas, swimming pool, plumbing works in Yenasu, Yeyebi, Freye, 0240-333-111, and NASA 0244-144-822. Me and Pa and Anna, we want swimming pool and we see it. Me want to, we want to be here. Family Dwelling, I want to. Family Dwelling. Go fast, you see Anna, shit. Hello, 
Hello and welcome back to Talk Time. And as I indicated, we are in a conversation with Marian Manatovani. I hope I got the name right. Uh, who is in the International Secretariat of the BDS Movement. Now, BDS Movement, where is it? I mean, what is the concept? What is it? Well, BDS stands for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions. And it is uh, fundamentally the movement that uh, is built on uh, the call that Palestinian civil society, all the different political forces and so on, brought out together in 2005, uh, calling for the isolation of apartheid uh, Israel. Uh, the concept really is born out, out of the idea that if uh, uh, a just peace, uh, justice, freedom, and equality for Palestinians has to be found, it needs, uh, first of all, that Israel has an incentive even to get to that one. As long as Israel is profiting and profiteering from its oppression of the Palestinian people, and it has the full backing of the international community, there is no way uh, Palestinians will be able to uh, gain their freedom. Um, and it is very similar to what the boycott movement was in South Africa, where it became as well clear that the isolation of that apartheid regime was a fundamental support to the struggle on the ground uh, of uh, the South African uh, uh, people. So in 2005, that call was given out, and uh, a nonviolent uh, movement globally has formed of uh, people, organizations, trade unions, parties, uh, churches, uh, intellectuals, artists, uh, sports people joining in in that call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And it has become uh, by now. Uh, the uh, leading solidarity and the most effective solidarity uh, effort uh, with the Palestinian people. So clearly, um, what is the intention? Boycott, divest, and sanctions. What is the intention? What do we do, ordinary citizens of the world, you know? I guess they exactly it's these three levels where you have on the one hand the boycott that is uh, your individual choice uh, of uh, buying or not buying products of uh, uh, going uh, to a concert or not going to a concert uh, uh, and I think it's important that it's not only about buying Israeli products or not buying Israeli products. Uh, uh, the question here is not identity, but the question is complicity with apartheid as a crime against humanity. And uh, we have, uh, since the beginning, worked on a number of uh, multinational companies that have been core in sustaining and profiting uh, from Israeli apartheid. At the moment, one of the boycott campaigns that we are having is the campaign against Puma, the uh, sports uh, shoes and clothing uh, company mm -hmm. which is uh, sponsoring Israel's football team with the demand that they should not uh, they should uh, stop sponsoring Israel's uh, football team uh, including the football teams in the in the illegal settlements um, another level then is the divestment the divestment is that uh, uh, churches or investment funds or so on divest and not invest in uh, Israeli apartheid. And the third level then really is the sanctions uh, level, where states are asked to uh, go and uh, uh, impose sanctions, uh, military embargo on Israeli apartheid. Now, it is clear that uh, within that line, we need to always find ways as well to, uh, to work 
one um, tool that we've uh, been using in a, a number of countries, understanding that not in every country we can go and ask the government uh, from now to tomorrow to, buy, to put sanctions on Israel, is the idea to build at least apartheid-free zones. Uh, we may not uh, be able to liberate Ghana or another place uh, for that matter immediately from Israeli apartheid. The government will not be ready to do it. But uh, the Pan-African TV can consider itself a space free of Israeli apartheid. It will not pro uh, propagate Israeli propaganda. It will not use Israeli or complicit companies uh, uh, when it uh, buys uh, uh, equipment, for example. Um, cultural spaces, trade unions, uh, many different physical and virtual spaces can become apartheid-free zones and build slowly the strength towards uh, uh, pushing governments to take real action. Mm. Now, are there not Israeli citizens and organizations who are opposed to Zionist occupation of Palestine? Oh, there are. There are not many, but they are. Uh, there are not many because it is really, really difficult within the framework of an Israeli society where the indoctrination uh, is so strong from the very moment you start schooling uh, where it is uh, so difficult to... I mean, fundamentally, when as an Israeli citizen you decide to fully support the Palestinian cause, you lose the support of your family, uh, you have problems at your workplace, uh, you are fundamentally isolated within your own society. So there are not many Israeli activists. Those that are around are excellent supporters. Uh, but it will not be a self-awakening of that society if not with pressure from outside that can really make the change. Does the BDS movement make exception for Israelis who are opposed to the occupation of Palestine? It's not only we uh, make an exception to Israelis that are opposed. We are not boycotting Israelis as such. Uh, we are boycotting Israeli institutions, we are boycotting Israeli co uh, companies, we are boycotting the Israeli government. We do not boycott individuals uh, mm -hmm. because it is not a question of identity, it is a question of complicity. Uh, for example, in the academic boycott, uh, there is no boycott, uh, and that's a bit different from the boycott in, in the times of South Africa. Uh, there is no boycott on the individual professors. There is a boycott if they come representing their universities. Mm. So, uh, yeah, that's a bit the difference. How successful has this BDS movement been so far? Um, I'd say extremely successful, especially remembering that in 2005, now 16 years ago, when Palestinians came out with this call, most of uh, even solidarity groups thought that that was impossible. And since 2005 until today, there wasn't a week where there wasn't a small victory here or there, whether that's in New Zealand, whether that is in California, in Santiago de Chile, or in Accra, Ghana. There is always, this movement has been growing for 16 years without break. And I think that's, uh, I, I consider myself really uh, privileged to be part of uh, that ongoing su success story, which is really exceptional in the history of social movements. Um, in 2014, then, uh, nine years after the call came out, Israel uh, built up an entire ministry uh, to fight the BDS movement. Just at the beginning of the year, they dissolved the ministry because they realized that it was useless. They weren't able to uh, stop that movement from grow growing. So in this sense, uh, we are growing every year. And 
last year was a key year for the Palestinian BDS uh, uh, movement because it was the moment when we really said we're doing the ultimate step towards uh, the sanctions and towards targeting the United Nations. In fact, last July, uh, uh, together with uh, uh, leaders and activists uh, from uh, Africa, Asia, and Latin America, we came together to launch the Global South Response, uh, a manifesto that for the first time outlined what now has become uh, the key uh, uh, effort towards, uh, towards sanctions, which is uh, the demand for the UN to investigate Israel for the crime of apartheid, for that crime against humanity, to reactivate uh, the special committee and uh, the center against apartheid and to impose sanctions and a military embargo. Now, that's a long way to go, but it's as well not that impossible. I mean, last year we thought it was like, we had already uh, 10 ex-presidents and uh, a lot of uh, intellectual leaders from the global south. Uh, well, a year later, we, we have even a UN investigation committee that is looking into systemic uh, uh, racial discrimination in Palestine. We have Israel's biggest human rights organization saying that Israel is an apartheid state. We have even Human Rights Watch that is normally not one of the most progressive organizations saying the same. And we have already support from certain governments uh, towards that. Uh, so uh, what last year still sounded completely, I have a dream. Uh, now it starts to become, I have a real concrete political project that in the coming years uh, can be fulfilled. Well, viewers, we are talking to Marine Manatovani. And uh, she works with the International Secretariat of the BDS movement. And she is in Accra, as you can see. We're going to go for another short break. And when we come back from the break, I'd like, first of all, to find out from her what she is doing in Accra. And then to look generally at the African situation with regards to Palestine. Short break. conversation about Palestine, we are in conversation about the International Secretariat of the BDS movement, and we are very, very excited to have in our studio one of the ladies in charge of this big movement, worldwide movement, Maren Manatovani. What are you doing in Accra? What I'm doing in Accra is part of a, an uh, overall tour through Africa um, to uh, discuss with people uh, uh, what I said uh, has now become the key uh, strategy for the Palestinian people, the call for the UN to investigate Israeli apartheid. And uh, when we think about this uh, project, political project, uh, of uh, holding Israel accountable for this crime against humanity, apartheid, and uh, to build up uh, an anti-apartheid movement, then it becomes clear that one doesn't do anti-apartheid campaigning without Africa. Apartheid is 
an African issue, not only a South African issue, is an issue of blackness. So for Palestinians, it was fundamental to come to Africa and talk about this campaign, about these strategies, and see how we can work together. And uh, it is as well part of an effort uh, of uh, the Palestinian people to uh, strengthen the ties that have been always with the African people since the struggles uh, and the common struggles against independence. Uh, it was always Africa to support Palestine. And that is slowly changing. That is slowly changing because Israel has tried over the last two decades uh, very shrewdly to enter and to penetrate into uh, African institutions uh, and governments and to really sell back to Africa apartheid once again. And the question is how can we work together to stem that and uh, to ensure that Africa remains free of apartheid, never mind whether that's South African uh, or Israeli. And there are a number of uh, ways how Israel has tried that to do so in the last uh, uh, decades. And uh, uh, fundamentally, there are two big propaganda tools that they're having here. The first thing is uh, creating confusions between what is uh, uh, the colonial project of Israel on the ground against the Palestinian people and what is written in the Bible. And uh, there are churches around as well in Africa that are trying to convince people that what is written in the Bible and that uh, what Israel is doing is some kind of uh, divine intention. Now, a crime against apartheid, uh, a crime against humanity is not a divine intention. It is a human-made crime that we need to stop. Um, the other big propaganda tool is the idea that Israel comes uh, to help uh, uh, Africans to make the desert bloom because they say that they made the desert bloom in Palestine and they would ensure that that would be happening in Africa as well. Well, first of all, they didn't make the desert bloom. Second of all, uh, one shouldn't make the desert bloom. Thirdly, uh, this entire propaganda machine that is coming here and saying Israel is bringing this technology and so on. If one really looks at the numbers, what Israel is really bringing here is really a tiny little bit of uh, efforts that any kind of uh, European or North American private donor uh, would have in their budget as well. I mean, I've been looking around at the various things from uh, 63 sheep here or 10 uh, irrigation kits to, to, to Ghana. I mean, this is not the way how the African people can be bought. And it's actually as well not the way. The real way how Israel is entering into Africa is with uh, tools they're not talking about, but where the big money is, and that is military trade. This is Israel exporting military uh, weapons and surveillance and repressive tools uh, to, to Africa. And over the last decade, uh, the exports of Israel to Africa in only weapons, and that excludes the kind of surveillance uh, uh, technology, has risen 309%. That means that what Israel is really doing is, on the one hand, uh, sustaining its own military machine with the money that is coming from Africa, because they're not giving it for free, the African people are paying for it, uh, re-importing apartheid technology to Africa, and at the end of the day, Israeli weapons are not only killing Palestinians, but Africans as well. And that is really the connection that Israel is creating under the a uh, smokescreen of, we are here to help. And uh, that is a bit uh, uh, a trend that I think both Palestinians and Africans once again have a common ground together that what we really uh, would want to see is freedom, justice, and equality 
in Palestine and as well in Africa. The Israelis have been coming to the African governments and saying, if you want protection, we are there for you. We are the security power of the world. So, is that true? Well, I mean, what is protection? Uh, protection against what? Exactly. I mean, if you want uh, to arm yourself against your own people, i.e. become a, prog uh, a repressive regime, a dictatorship, well, I have to admit that Israel has good weapons for that one. Because that's what they're, what they're training and this is what uh, they're developing every day on the blood of the Palestinian people. But if we want to actually protect human rights, sustainable development in Africa, then Israel has nothing to offer. Because it does not conceive a system where human rights are actually protected. Because it's, uh, uh, agriculture is not made to create food to feed the people, but it's agriculture is created to colonize land and to expel the people and the communities, indigenous people and communities that were living there. Uh, so Israel does not have anything to offer to anybody in Africa that really wants uh, democracy, human rights, uh, and uh, sustainable development. Unfortunately, uh, fact is that even within the framework of the African Union, Israel has lately gained observer status uh, that was, again, anti-democratic, again, against the African Union Charter on uh, Peoples and Human Rights that clearly mandates uh, the fight against racism, against colonialism, against apartheid, and explicitly against Zionism, the ideology underlying uh, uh, the Israeli apartheid regime. And uh, that decision was made by the chairperson of the African Union, Musa Faki, without any uh, uh, kind of consultation, let alone with the people, not even with the states that are members of the African Union. And uh, we are at the moment in literally a battle of the soul of Africa. And, uh, W together with many uh, African uh, states, uh, trying to see how we ensure that Israel gets off the table of the African Union again. Well, viewers, we're going to go for another short break. And uh, when we come back, we like to discuss some of the myths, the myth, the myth in the way of the liberation of the Palestinian people. I mean, for example, myths about Wailing Wall, myths about the kibbutz system, and, and so on and so on. Short break.
Well, welcome back to Talk Time. And uh, we are talking about the BDS movement and its impact in the struggle to liberate Palestine from colonial rule. And we are privileged to have with us Marian Manotovani. First time hearing this name, so, you know. But there's so many myths about Israel. There are people who actually spend enormous resources and they go to Israel because they think that if they go and pray by the wailing wall, all their problems will go away. There are people who see Israel as some kind of a religious nirvana, God's own home, and so on. You know, if you criticize Israel, you will be criticizing God, and, and so on, and so forth. Are these myths real? Well, the myths are, myths are real. Uh, the problem <laughs> is <laughs> that they are exactly that with myths. Yeah. Um, and they are a very uh, um, organized and systematically planted uh, um, way to uh, take uh, the people and the... Uh, yeah, indoctrinate them to make them believe the opposite of what is real. And, I mean, the fact that churches have been used uh, to promote injustice is unfortunately uh, nothing so new. If you look at the South African uh, apartheid regime, the churches were for a long time arguing that uh, South Africa was some kind of promised land for the white people. Now we're all laughing about it, but it's more or less the same thing when they say that uh, Palestine is the promised land for, uh, for the Jewish people. Um, one thing is uh, what has been written in the Bible but this is not what is happening on the ground in Palestine. What is happening in Palestine, what Israel is, is a colonial bro project, which is not a divine invention. It's a British imperialist invention. Uh, in 1917, uh, the, uh, some white European Jews came together very much... Uh, uh, imbued with the colonial idea that white people can go around the world, take wherever they want their land, kick out the people and say that's ours. And as everybody did that, they wanted to do the same and they wanted as well their place. And they went to the, to the British Empire and said we, uh, we would like to uh, take that piece of land that is Palestine. And they said literally we'll be the bulwark of the West against barbarism and the British said great idea then we are anyway already in a colonial overstretch and we know that sooner or later we need to uh, uh, withdraw if you want to be literally the military base for us there in this crucial place between Asia Africa and Europe that is Palestine that is a fantastic idea you can do that and it was Lord Balfour and later Ch uh, Winston Churchill, not uh, God or Jesus Christ, to mandate what has happened. And I think that should be very clear. We cannot put a crime against humanity and colonialism in the shoes of, uh, of God and uh, 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 those beliefs. Um, on the other hand, uh, what is really happening... Uh, is, uh, and that is as well what people should understand, Palestine, Palestinians are the Christians. I mean, Bethlehem, Jerusalem, Nazareth, places that are fundamentally Palestinian, places that are the fundamental Christian places. And what is happening here that we have the Palestinians, which are Christians, Muslims, and Jews, but, and that are the indigenous people of that land that are being colonized and expelled and ethnically cleansed by a colonial power fundamentally put there by uh, Europe and, and the US 
There is nothing holy about that. Where is the Church of Nativity, if, if you know? Church of Nativity, where, where is it? It is in Bethlehem. That was my first experience when I came to Palestine. When I came to Palestine, I was in Bethlehem, and the first thing uh, that happened the very day I came to Palestine was Israel besieging and profanating the church while Palestinians were inside the church seeking protection and protecting the church. So uh, when we're talking about uh, the scene of, uh, of the nativity at now uh, in December and uh, uh, what is happening here is that church of the nativity, this place of the nativity, uh, is under siege by Israel and Palestinians are under siege uh, who are the guardians of this, uh, uh, this city and uh, this, uh, these places. So it's really completely the opposite. So Jesus was born in Palestine? He was born in Palestine, absolutely. So all the pilgrimages to Jesus' birthplace in Israel, what is it about? They are pilgrimages to Palestine. They are pilgrimages to the historic Palestinian places. Uh, like pilgrimages have ever uh, always happened. And it was pilgrimages uh, from Christian communities, from Jewish communities, and from Muslim communities. The interesting thing about Palestine, and that is being destroyed by the Israeli apartheid regime, is that it was a space where everybody could find refuge. We, uh, People that were persecuted from across the world were coming, including the Jewish people. Uh, we have a strong African, co Palestinian African community in Jerusalem. We have uh, people, uh, Armenians that fl uh, fled the, the genocide came there as well. They were all welcome and they were living together. And it was interesting that the chief rabbi of uh, Jerusalem uh, explicitly sent a letter to uh, the United Nations uh, regarding the idea of the creation of the State of Israel. And he said, do not do it. Because Palestine was a place where we were living together uh, throughout the centuries between religions. If you create Israel, you will make uh, this place a place uh, of war, a place of insecurity for all of us. And this is what is really happening. Maren, thanks very much for coming to the studio. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and we wish you the best in your stay in Ghana. Thank you very, very, very much for coming to the studio. Thank you for the time and for the show. Now, viewers, I hope that we've gained a little more understanding of the state of Palestine, its struggles, and so on. I hope that we've all learned a bit. This discussion will continue. Discussion about Palestine, discussion about pop other popular struggles and so on, will continue in your homes and on this very television set. Until we meet again next week, my advice is please keep your dial on Pan-African television because we bring you the best in news, the best in entertainment, the best in sports, the best in kinds of best, best in everything. So please keep your dial on Pan-African Television until we meet again next week. Until then, it's goodbye from all of us at Pan-African Television, including the director of the show, Adam Lumo, and the producer, of course, George Vinet. Bye-bye until we see you again next week. Bye-bye. African.